Hello, everyone. So nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is Erica Boss. I am the Cultural Arts uh, Director at the Jewish Community Center. Um, I would just like to say thank you all so much for coming. We're very excited to host this. Um, <laughs> uh, this is our first uh, reading of the season. We actually have two more coming up. Um, they are available to sign up on our website right now. Um, the second one will be February 22nd, and the third one will be March 21st. And I can, I, I'll be able to drop links to you guys. I have everybody's email as well. Um, thank you so much, Philip Terman and, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me, uh, Baru November for being our host this evening. They have been the backbone of this program. Uh, they, they've lined up all our poets together, and they've created this amazing series, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I would just like to remind everyone if we could please stay muted, that way we don't have any sort of distractions while our poets are reading their work. Um, we will have a brief Q&A um, at the end of the readings. Um, however, please feel free to drop any sort of comments or questions in the text chat at any time. All righty, I'll, uh, I'll hand it off to you, Bara and <laughs> Phil. Thanks. Uh... Erica, thanks so much for the JCC for sponsoring this and, and, and uh, creating a space for poetry. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks you all for coming. And uh, we have some amazing throughout the whole series. And we're going to start it off really strong with these folks. So they're really great. Um, normally, we, we, we sort of like um, match up poets with basically their I, th I feel three tonight, uh, and I think as you hear them, I think that they're uh, they have some um, mutual mutual uh, devotions, so that that they, they share. So we're going to do an alphabetical order, and just remind if you have any as you listen and you you have any questions or you might want to ask uh, after the read. Um, save them for that and it'd be great to to hear that so um Alison Patini Davis is going to be our first poet um and um I'm really excited to hear her read she's the author of line study of a motel clerk uh with Barabob Barabob Press in 2017 which is an incredible book it was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award and the Ohio Anna Book Award her poetry and scholarship have appeared or forthcoming from, get this, The Best American Poetry, The Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day series, The New Republic, The Oxford American Studies in American Literature. She holds a PhD in English and Creative Writing and Fellowships from, Stan from the Stanford University's Wallace Stegner Program um, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown and the Serving House, Serving House Beck Fund for Study at Vilnius Yiddish Institute, which is kind of cool. Uh, and she was born, which is as cool, Youngstown, Ohio. So from Youngstown, Ohio to uh, to the Yiddish Institute. What I love about poetry, which is very, uh, a lot, um, is her cap uh, capaciously wide range of vision, both in terms of her thematic depth and variation of craft. In other words, her poems don't skim over the surface. Um, she's at once devoted to her subjects as she is a multifaceted of language that shapes them, articulates a knowing passion that at once embraces family, ancestry, history, while at the same time focuses laser beam scrutiny of her particular holy land. In Allison's case, I'll say it's Youngstown, Ohio, and it's environs, northeastern Ohio, that her attentions, um, that her attention sings and and give our attention the true spirit and proximity of her devotions even more allison's devotions to fan her mishboha and in the tradition of poets like james wright those unsung heroic laborers not to in her range of countless references from yiddish language poets to youngstown rock and rollers and uh her poetry reminds me that youngstown is not just a pastrami sandwich at kravitz's deli so, without any further ado, <laughs> Allison, let's hear you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. It's the nicest introduction I've ever had. Um, means so much coming from you. I think seven of us here are from Northeast Ohio, so people actually got most of that, I think. 
Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Phil and Baruch and JCC Buffalo and Erica for organizing and for everyone for listening in, especially my parents. Um, it's really meaningful for me to get to read with other Jewish poets. So thank you, Sean and Arthur. Arthur. Um, a warning that I have some adult subject matter in these poems. So if your kids are around, just to give you a warning. Um, my kids have heard it, so yours will be okay, baby. Um, and in general, um, as Phil said, I write about the Jewish experience in the Rust Belt. And these are poems from a few different projects. Um, all right, so this first poem um, is kind of a, a conglomeration of thinking about the Rust Belt and visiting my grandma in her condo in Florida and the kibbutz movement. I was kind of um, thinking about them all at the same time. And it's also a lot about nature and it was just Tu Bishvat. Um, so I'll start with this one. Um, every sentence starts with the letter O. A lot of my poetry is playing kind of games with the alphabet. Old world orthography. One version starts with the villagers smiling, their smocks rough with pine, their eyes squeeze shut from all the sun. Oranges dot their thoughts in place of periods. Ordinary soil cruds their phone booths. Observing custom, nothing goes to waste. They fuck on top of flags to stripe them beautiful with sweat. Oldest daughters are unionized. October wind reweights the branches until red apples swing brave and shy. One morning, there's a vote to name the land, which is required for official tax purposes, and all at once, it's barren. All of groves give out. Observing custom, villagers accept that they can't fix the world, nor desist from it either. On cue, they form a circle in the dirt where everyone starts arguing. Over time, this works. The fruit trees reacclimate. Blossoms vow out in budding green. Old villagers finish sweeping around their condos, which everyone calls a good sign. Occasionally, all right nicks still lean out car windows to yell, give up, or move to the city. But the villagers only nod and cast smiles obscurely as seeds into the dirt. Um, these next few poems are spoken by a group I invented called the Neighborhood Girls. Um, they work at a Dairy Queen Youngstown, Ohio, and they're Jewish. Um, so the next few are, are in their voice. Um, this first one has an epigraph by George Oppen from his poem, Semite. Um, My distance is neither Roman nor barbarian. Uh, this one is about boobs in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> the neighborhood girls can't measure up. Tverki's great granddaughter is a 34D. By our measurements, the bitch is more a B. But who's counting outside of Sears where yellow tape ladies <laughs> pedal brassieres that reach from ribcage to Saturday night, the distance from downtown to Shaker Heights, from front clasp to back clasp to up, push up to slaughter, a cheer for distance and all it's bought her. Tverki's great granddaughter has a nice pair and looks at us like we have nothing to spare, but we've read our Torah and we'll give her a hand for a hand. We'll give her what we demand of distance after all her lies. A watch will bring her down to size. Mm. Um, this next one, also a neighborhood girl's poem, it has an epigraph from Bereshit, and the Lord called out to man, and he said to him, where are you? This is referring to um, when Adam realizes he's naked in the Garden of Eden. Um, and in this poem, the neighborhood girls get a visit from um, Christian missionaries in the middle of the poem. In the beginning, the neighborhood girls read Philip Roth drunk in their baths. In the beginning, we clock out and rev our Camaros until the red lights down Market Street go green. Oh, reverse ripening, we grow farther and farther from our sweet spots until back home, we fill our baths and knock, knock, who's there? Do you have time to talk? Do you have time to talk who? Do you have time to talk about the Lord? Missionaries never get us off. In the beginning, we point to mezuzahs, lock up the doors, slide over the chains, get in our tubs, crack open some cores, and then knock, knock. In the beginning, we read Roth in the bath, his books all the same. Those who tempt you with fruit are, by the end, going to make you get nose jobs. Knock, knock. In the beginning, there's a shit ton of darkness and light and infinite grapes, so wine is real cheap, like Francia, a week of its goodness, and then drunk in our tubs, so suddenly struck by our bodies. We're asked, like Adam, where are you? And we speak of Ohio as Roth spoke of Newark until the voice interrupts from some awful distance. 
And who told you that you are naked? <laughs> um, two more neighborhood girl poems. This is one more Cleveland one. The neighborhood, and this is, I think, as obscene as this reading gets, so you could bring your kids back to this. Um, the neighborhood girl dates every Jew in Cleveland. It's not autobiographical, it's the neighborhood girls. Which means our day of the week underwear are on Shaker and Rich Richmond, and our hearts still riding the escalator. Which means, Solomon Finer, if you don't like us, that's fine, there are others. Which means you'll knock up the blonde anyway and have to marry her. Oh well, it was fun while it lasted. Your drugs and our legs, our legs and your friends. It was fun when you opened the door and Leah from Stolen was exhaling. And we thought, the last time we saw you, you were innocently bleaching your lip hair. What happened, Cleveland? The humidity at gas stations on summer mornings is one history, the bridges another. But now the Great Lake, Great Lake bow shift gives a short shrift on night shift, gives good head and bad bleacher seats, gives history freely to just anyone coming down the turnpike. Um, so I have a lot of those poems and um, one critique I got about them is that they're kind of too funny to be taken seriously. Um, so this is a response poem to that. Um, and this poem is spoken by me with the final line by the neighborhood girls. It also has a line from Louise Glick. The function of humor in the neighborhood. Humor functions in the neighborhood as it functioned in the shtetl. The only way into a world insisted on your pain, something you'd be shot for. If they want you to cry, tears are evasive. If they want you vulnerable, vulnerability's a cop-out. If they want a confession, your confession is cheap. When I speak passionately, that's when I'm least to be trusted. A privilege to weep when to laugh is to choke on history. Oh, diaspora, 75 years ago, I'd be gassed beside my sisters. Yet here I am, running out for milk in a heated car. Does a funnier joke exist? Yet there's so many jokes in this neighborhood, that one barely gets a laugh. You're telling us. All right, uh, so that's the Neighborhood Girl poems. Um, this next one is a longer one, um, the only longer poem I'll read, um, that I wrote after Roe versus Wade was overturned. Um, and afterwards, my local temple still decided to have an event called Patriotic Shabbat and kept texting me about it and it was making me angry. Um, so I wrote a poem about it. Um, the first and last words of each um, line in this poem began with the same letter to kind of indicate the cyclical and spiraling nature of the narrator. Um, and also kind of the lack of progress um, made in the country. It's set up, if you know the subreddit, um, am I the asshole, where someone kind of shares their interpersonal conflict and some, the rest of the people decide is the person an asshole or not. Um, I think that's all you need to know. Raid Eye for Set Regrets. The Rust Belt is the center of a circle. Neon alphabet to the middle, and nice and easy, stretch it to the border. Allow slack. This is a geometric situation to get a voice out of the valley hotter than a Chevy Vega. Am I an asshole, begins the poem, because I set regrets to patriotic Shabbat, insulting the temple. Don't I know that the reversal of Roe, slavery, settler colonism continued, but stop my temple in Wheeling, West by God, Virginia, from bestowing blessings on this fair country. Officially, the rabbi ruled that anger is ineffective and not aligning with the Jewish value of kindness. Were I patriotic, then, instantly, our nation would change its opinion of me, mark the good Jew box, then restore my rights. Diasporic, dialectic, to get from here to there intact, I've needed to be inflexible. I'm not shouting, there is just a bad connection between West Virginia and the coasts. I gave birth two years ago at Wheeling Hospital. Yesterday, I called my obgyn because if I was were to conceive again, the hospital, very Catholic, is the only hospital in town. I ask, can they save me if? I'm 36, advanced maternal age. Before, I wanted a natural birth. I didn't want an epidural. I took a hypnosis class to withstand pain. Did it work for me? After the epidural, I could feel finally the radius of my range. I was able to return inside my body. I still realized, trust me, when to push. Should I have just gone to goddamn patriotic Shabbat? It's the only shul in a 55 mile radius. My toddler is happy there making hamantashen. 
and now that COVID isn't as bad, kissing mezuzahs. I feel bad. I even liked the hospital in the end, the way my doctor took the bris seriously when the rabbi, respecting COVID policies, recited the brachas over the phone. But to barter with the Rust Belt, saying lefty Lucy so slowly that just due to inflation, things are tightening. Accusations of overreacting or permit the temple its patriotism, the definitions it must doctor to survive. Rust Belt temples aren't surviving. The one I grew up at merged. The walls of the Wheeling Temple are thick with the Yortzite plaques with the names of former area temples high across the tops. How exactly they testify, this isn't our temple. The ex their exiles crowd the Bima until the circumference of outrage is orange, but packable, a pinball, shuddering between two buffers. There's insignificant progress while idling, but speaking, am I getting anywhere better? I have driven all night and I'm still in the Rust Belt. I have dobbined all day and still Hashem's total silence. Takes one coin from me to play pinball. Please take the money. The Rust Belt is relatively affordable. And over the border in Columbus, Ohio, a friend's verdict comes back as you're not the asshole. Yet what are the precedents? Yet how else could he answer, seeing I'm the only one of me around? Halfway, I reconsider the rabbi. After all, he's pro-choice. And while busy, we'll prioritize golfing with Joe Manchin to sort things out. Gosh, can't I just be patient? Can't I let the man handle this? And by this, I mean my cunt. No, I don't want to serve on any more panels about dismantling power while sitting high up at a table poets were made to compete for. It's mathematical. The angle of a head tilted up towards a flag. A pencil cup is pulled back until it breaks. It's always very difficult to compromise when compromise is violets disguised as ice cream. We can lick it till it's gone, the dilemma, till it's dripping down our chest like spurting milk. I remember the cotton I wore, in, wore inside my bra, lactation hotline calls where I just wanted a nurse to scream at me, this is what you fucking signed up for. But instead, polite encouragement, yellow tubs of lanolin. Remember, I'm not alone. The momentum of poets captured and redirected somewhere more centralized, a flag sure as sugar on the horizon. It's clear we all had art in us, but now, now what has become of my student who got famous and died? How can I think of his father across the country, across the flatness and the projections, 7-Elevens, arches and silver mined out to the gray salty sea? There are people between here and there sending regrets to everything. They earmark the origin. There are witches who drink beer in Berkeley and cast spells on politicians. There are women in the Rust Belt who would kill for a Coors Light. And this poem, if this poem had a beer neon, it'd be right here. Here is the little chain that turns it on. And I am beneath it with my child, circling my hands towards Shabbat candles, a, move, a movement that divides evenly into the lowest common denominator of life. Silence. This one has an epigraph by Isaac Bashevis Singer. How long will you be silent, almighty, almighty sadist? They gathered around the silence. They wondered who should break it, what to break it with. The holiest one, he refused, and they were glad of it. Can you understand this kind of gladness? Like the relief of a cloudy day when you've been too lucky. Like luck, an alphabet to break from, rolling with poppy seeds for vowels. We were taught it, silent olive, silent opening. We practiced sounding it out and broke into laughter. What quiet children, our teacher praised the chalk clicking against the wax green board, tree buds blowing through the wall of open windows and scattering over the floor. The silence lengthened by those who couldn't speak in such weather. For lunch, they gave us orange segments and a question with many answers. One was forgetting. One was our father's fathers, most of whom we never met, many of whom are silent. What happens when you call upon the silent? It depends on what you consider an answer. Some said, let the silence be. Some talked over it until it became indistinguishable from listening. Some said they were making too much out of it. Making too much out of nothing, one said, slamming his hand on a table. The problem is that we're making too little, not enough to get by. Maybe not for you, a woman yelled back. I guess it depends on what you consider enough. There are historic precedents. The holiest one found this remark hilarious, but they were always fasting, so it was hard to tell. They all felt... They all faced east, but with all their swaying, it was hard to tell. Um, I have three left. Is there time for that? 
two, three. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So that last one and this next one are from my book, Line Study by Motel Clerk. And the motel, um, there have been five generations of my family there now, um, either working or hanging out. Um, and it's still open. And I'm really glad my dad could be here tonight, um, who is the, the motel clerk. This next one um, is about um, Sandy Scheuer, who was killed in the Kett State shootings. Um, and she's buried in the same cemetery as my grandfather in Youngstown, along with many of your other family members and people who are here. So shout out to everyone's uh, ancestors. The Jewish Cemetery at Youngstown. The motel clerk's at one end of O of Sedek Cemetery and Sandra Scheuer's at the other. She was shot walking to class at Kett State. His obituary headline, owned motel. I didn't know either of them. My grandma knew both. We set rocks on their icy graves, say Kaddish. In the Jewish cemetery at Newport, Longfellow asked what drove each person across the sea. After the shootings, Mr. Scheuer said, we left Germany to guarantee our daughters could live in a country with freedom. Her grave looks like the rest. I've met her sister, and if I were her, I'd be sick of people historicizing my sister, parading her as I'm parading her, as art parades things, and for what? So I can imagine my grandparents in love. When they fought, he'd lock himself in the car, and in full view of the neighbors, she'd pound on the windshield. He'd watch her lipsticked mouth rage silently on the other side of the glass. Sandy Scheuer, forgive me, do you remember my grandmother? She's the widow standing in the cold and nothing will shut her up above the grave where she's still talking as if he hears her, as if the grounds and Ohio windshield, her ruby mouth scrapes to clear of snow. One time when I workshopped that poem, I was in California and they said, we don't know about the verb scrape. Why would you have to scrape snow? And I'm like, because you guys are from California, you don't know what it means to scrape snow of a windshield. So that was a word I did not change. All right, these last two are from my most recent project called Outskirts, um, which combines lyric, uh, a lyric poem and a prose poem about the international Rust Belt experience. This one's called Potatoes. In Lithuania, my Estonian Yiddish teacher teaches the class a folk song about potatoes to help us learn the days of the week. In English, it goes Sunday, potatoes, Monday, potatoes, Tuesday and Wednesday, potatoes, Thursday and Friday, potatoes, Shabbat is a novelty, a potato kugel, Sunday, more potatoes. At the Yiddish summer language program, the students are from all over the world. I have a friend, a Jewish Ukrainian. She's from Lugatsk, a post-industrial city in the East. We can barely speak each other's languages and we are both horrible at Yiddish. Yet somehow we get by for three weeks of feeding the local ducks and staring into mass graves on field trips. Years later, I visit her in Lugatsk with my now husband, who's a Russian historian. Because they're able to speak to each other in Russian, they have much deeper conversations than we ever could. I constantly ask him for summaries as we wander around town, past billboards of half-naked women advertising tool shops, and places where you bring glass bottles to have them refilled with beer. Now, in 2022, Ukrainians use those bottles to make Molotov cocktails. Here's my last poem. It's also from the Outskirts series. Um, the few things you have to know is it refers to an earlier poem that talks about a bar in China's Rust Belt. Um, it also references a synagogue in my hometown, which is it's uh, merged, um, which is the fate of many Rust Belt synagogues. Um, and it's also the closing of Rust Belt synagogues is also mentioned um, in an episode of America Reframe, which is a PBS documentary, which is in here. Um, the final part of this poem references Devo, um, who are also from, who are from Akron, Ohio, which is near Youngstown. Um, so this is my last one. Thank you so much for listening. Rubber. Lower in the Popper's Paradise article, photos of regulars, a rag collector. He's captured at that America reframed angle designed to maximize pity. Yet I think of my father's photo in the paper above captions like, across from the motel stands a decrepit abandoned truck stop. My father in his baseball cap frowning his hands clasped somberly before him, is actually getting a real kick out of it and is excited to so excited to see his picture in the paper that he'll tape it up on the wall. I'm not saying the rag collector is actually happy. 
And the episode of America Reframed, where the camera holds too long and the old Jew from Latrobe as the synagogue is closing makes me weep. When he hands over the Rust Belt Torahs to a prosperous coastal congregation, everyone is celebrating the continuation of Judaism, but the old Jew is not smiling. He is what I mean by the outskirts, the tensile strength of the rag collector. The camera tries to get them, but bounces off. The band Devo was born out of the Kent State shootings and the collapse of the rubber industry in Akron. The band members were not idealists. Devo stands for de-evolution. Speaking of absurdist art movements, bassist Jerry Casal said, we had our very own backyard version of it, a rubber version. The song Whip It sold because people thought it was about sex. It is actually about capitalism, a critique of union busting Reaganomics. Devo didn't mind that people missed the point. On the contrary, they are where labor strikes stop and post-industrial cynicism begins. In a healthy capitalistic world, singer Mark's mother, Mark Mothersbrough explained, rebellion is just something else to market. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allison. That was great. Your poetry is a wonderful combination of honesty, humor, and an expression of everyday life that really uh, needs to be heard. So I'm really happy that I got to hear you tonight for the first time. Uh, anyway, my name is uh, Baruch November. Uh, I'm uh, one of your hosts. And I just want to thank the JCC for uh, featuring Jewish voices uh, in poetry. I think it's very important that we realize and not take for granted in this tumultuous world uh, how important it is to have a place for Jewish voices right now. And I'm happy to say that we ha have had the help of Erica and also her colleague, Mark, to produce this event. And we actually have not we, we actually have four more readings coming up so um uh stick stick stay stay tuned as they say but now i want to introduce um our next reader his name well uh is arthur russell and he's a multi-talented writer uh, he he was the winner of the 2023 Rattle Chapbook Prize and the 2023 Fractured Lit Flash Fiction P Prize. His books of poem his book of poems at the car wash captured the life of the everyday laborer and wonderfully echoed Philip Levine, in my opinion. In addition to having great wit. He has great skill when implementing memory into his poems without being modeling. In fact, his poems often conjure memories and unfold them crisply in the moment without the potential poison of nostalgia. His excellent works have appeared in Copper Nickel and Glimmer Train, among other pro publications. Additionally, he is one of the directors of Red Wheelbarrow Poets of Rutherford, New Jersey, where he leads the weekly workshop hosts the monthly reading series, and edits the annual journal. Arthur is not only a very fine writer, but he is a true character with a fine sense of humor, and I hope it is on display tonight. But I also hope that is not putting too much pressure on him. Without further ado, Arthur Russell. Thank you so much, Baruch. It's, uh, no, I, I cannot possibly live up to that introduction, so... I'll have to do something to discourage people from assuming that I'm any of those things. But thank you to the JCC for having me. And thank you because Baruch, you you and I met at a, at an open mic once or twice, and I think we just kind of liked each other. And it's so great that you've invited me to this venue and I've really enjoyed listening to Allison's poetry and look forward to hearing Sean's as well. So I have some poems from my book, which came out last year, and I've been reading them a lot, but I've also been writing new poems, and I'm excited about them, and I want to share them with people tonight. So I'm going to read a couple of poems from the book, um, and, and then I'll switch over. So the book, the book uh, revolves around my life in a member of a Jewish family that owns a car wash in Brooklyn in the middle of the, well, second half of the 20th century. 
and it involves, you know, my family in ways. So some of the poems are directly in the car wash, some are car wash adjacent, and some of them are years later. Um, and I'll, I'll start off with the first poem in the book. It's called The Car Wash. At the car wash at dawn, the darkness of the plant was permissive. Sometimes it had a pilot flickering in the hull of a heater, or the canvas towel bin glowed in the pallid gray of the skylight. Every morning for five years, 1,800 mornings. We might hear an air leak or water drip while walking back with our coffee cups gimbaled between index and thumbs, things we'd need to fix before we opened. And then at the electric panel, the knife switch took a palm to throw. The sequence of circuit breakers, compressors, and fluorescence coming on satisfied the order etched where habit met identity. Alan went to hang his army field coat and I washed the, and I walked the wash tunnel collecting license plates and other parts from yesterday. Charmed by the rust that bloomed overnight on the polished steel plate flooring and washed away each morning. Alan came to grease the bearings. The white grease pushed the greasy water out. And raising the car wash doors to put out the signs, I saw the lights progress, the men arriving. I checked the trash cans, got money for the register, hung the card of pine trees in the cashier booth, the tape loop playing in the empty customer walkway, selling hot wax to no one. And then we opened and the cars came and the people nodded to us and stood with crossed arms, watching the steam guns, the vacuum wands, the mats flung sideways to the mat rack for a rinse. And even as we watched, our lives peeled back and shed one layer, exposing the new day's delicate skin. Check out, man. Between cars, Freddy Rogers could spin a damp towel on his finger as if it were a terry cloth pizza. Take a quick drag off his Winston, go yeah, yeah to anything I'd say to him, turn his hat brim front to back or back to front, excuse himself and start out towards the bus stop where a girl he knew or wished to know was waiting for the B-68 to Coney Island, then give up as she passed inside restore his Winston to the ledge, and flipping his spinning towel ahead to land on the hood of the next car out. I'm going to skip ahead to the last poem in the book because I want to get to these new poems. Um, this one's called The Jetty. It's the last poem in the book. In between, I've dealt with a lot of issues, <laughs> but hopefully um, this won't be too abrupt. The Jetty. I stood on the slanted, wet, black stones piled from Brighton Beach into Rockaway Inlet with coffee and a cigarette metallic in the cold, salt air. Behind me, the six-story shtetl of bricks and heavy Jewish food backed up to the elevated subway, spine of the old neighborhood, escape route heading north over Mrs. Stahl's knishes towards Manhattan. Before me, Grandma Eva's ocean, it threw up lattices of spume from the blistered sea. I cuffed the drips in winter nose I inherited from my father and squinted toward the wind from Breezy Point, past which I'd sailed as far as Ambrose lightship once to see the ocean open past explaining. 
I swabbed locker rooms at 17 and mowed the lawn around white and red impatience, planted in the shape of the burgee of the yacht club where I tendered members to their sailboats at moorings in Sheepshead Bay. Evenings, when they'd all gone home, on my last run among the tethered boats that always swung to face the tide, I smoked and listened to my love on a cream-colored transistor radio with a gold tone grill and the name Electra, etched in red script beside the thumb wheel for the volume. I winched the lightning boats from their trailers on race days and swung them on a davit over the cyclone fence down to the bay, then followed in the committee boat past Kingsborough College and the seaside nursing home called Menorah, where 40 years later my father would die, dropped anchor in the inlet and fired blanks from a cannon to start the race that sent this regatta of school teachers, doctors, tradesmen, and a woman named Wendy with short black hair around a course of red and black channel markers, buoys and bells, white hulls like whale bellies turned upwards on a broad reach, or raising painted spinnakers like pregnant women in summer dresses, though none of this could reach me, where I bobbed unhappily and waited for the race to end. And then, at 33, after years of working with a damp towel over my shoulder and my arms crossed on my chest as the exit manager of the Hollywood car wash on Coney Island Avenue, speaking college French with the Haitians who dried the cars and leaving for law school while still living in Brighton Beach, I stood on these same rocks reciting mnemonic devices to prepare for the bar exam the summer I also came the closest to dunking a basketball in the playground at Brightwater Court. And 30 years later, with hips as brittle as butter chip cookies, I climb these rocks again to stare at the sea and back at the beach and the boardwalk and the men's room under the boardwalk where a boy once showed me his penis. I cut my feet on a broken bottle here when I ran with my sister to catch the orange drink man. I came for Tuesday fireworks and found my grandparents laughing with neighbors in woven web beach chairs when they were my age now. I brought girls home in my red Monte Carlo. I bought sturgeon from the fish store and cooked it in garlic and butter. I lived across from the synagogue where you could hear the men through open windows murmuring on Yom Kippur while women outside wondered how long after sunset the rabbi would keep them. I will never leave this place. So I'm going to move on to some newer stuff. I think this is just about the right time. Not so car wash adjacent. This is a poem from last week. It's called Letter to My Wife after Miklos Kadnoti. How tired you must be of my asking if you love me. How much? whether my lights have burned the full eight days, and if you think I'm handsome. Now, with you so far away, and me alone beneath these fallen leaves, I ask the squirrels digging near my head if you love me. I ask the starving deer which comes to eat the rhododendron leaves while she exudes her pellet poo, how much? And of the red-tailed hawk that lands close by to eat the little rabbit he holds down with talons and rips open with his beak, I ask how long my love for you has burned. But only you can tell me if I'm handsome. 
This one, also recent, <laughs> had to do with, well, I'll leave that out. It's called a Appointment in Clifton. Look! Look at all these outdated magazines in the doctor's office. I have outlived them all. Look at me, bandaged on painkillers, as though waiting for some nurse to fall in love with the crow's feet by my soulful eyes. Look, look at the citations and honors mounted, framed, and hung on the walls and the little hand sculpture I'd like to steal. This whole building with its parking lot and elevators is made of dead building materials. Only the receptionist and I are alive. Look, look, God is everywhere and nowhere, as are the doctor and medicine itself. This is how the world heals with rattles and song. All that's lacking is the rattles and the song. This next poem is called The New Sponge Trilogy. It has three parts. New Sponge Trilogy, part one. New Sponge Day Facebook post accompanied by photos. New Sponge Day is one of those half holidays celebrated in the home without a lot of fanfare. We remember sponges past, reminisce about mom's handy wipes, and our dad's telling us, don't throw the old one out, I'll take it down to the shop. Then, the inaugural sink and counter wipe, the stiff springiness of new cellulose, the stray thought about the blue dye they put in these things, and all those other decisions we make about when enough is enough. We look at the outgoing sponge with a surprising amount of regret, as if we'd breached a ribbed duty, betrayed a trust we undertook when we brought it home. And then after letting the old one shrink like a mushroom, we take it down to the shop, to the cabinet above the slop sink, where my daughter will find it and dozens more, some stacked neatly and some tumbling sideways, like bones in the ossuary of contingent necessity. Part two, reply to Janet Kay, who commented, quote, just think of it as a hotel with 500 million guests, end quote. Room service, this is Hydrostephylococcus in cranny number 49-57234. Can you send up some plate scrapings? Whatever's wet. My great, 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 great grandmother stayed in this very sponge cranny about 20 minutes ago. So, my sister, well, actually, as the product of binary fission, my mother slash daughter was up on the sponge scrubbing surface. Yeah, the dark blue part. And she says the views are just outstanding. She says she saw Arthur Russell. No, not the avant-garde cellist, the lawyer from Nutley, New Jersey, standing over the sink, eating a fried egg sandwich. Yeah, divorced. Anyway, can't go, can't talk, got to split. Part three, Hollis, my high school class of 74 and Facebook friend, privately messages me. Artie. When my mom saw you in Sing, and then as director of the senior show, Damn Yankees, and playing Grandpa Martin Vanderhoff and You Can't Take It With You, she actually asked me, what about that Arthur Russell kid? He seems interesting. And I told her, you were a clown, a flirt, a hummingbird, a hummingbird with an albatross around its neck, about this long-term unrequited crush you had on Leslie Gollin, I mean, everybody, we weren't even close. The whole school knew that she wore the same floor length jean skirt every day for over a year. She was into drugs and you were writing acrostic love sonnets with her name down the side. How could anybody get close to you? Flash forward 50 years, you post you got divorced. And then last month, 
you post your lifelong friend Leslie has died of liver cancer. And I thought, my God, this guy. I even wanted to tell my mother. Can you imagine that? My mother passed six years ago. And now this cockamamie thing about the sponges. Very funny, Artie. Very funny. But I have to say, let it go, Artie. Just let it go. Uh, this next poem, um, and I guess the last couple of poems I'm going to read. Yeah, got time for it. two poems. They're both very recent poems, and I think a lot of us uh, in the poetry community and out are pretty con concerned with war and our Judaism, wars in Ukraine and so forth. And in the poetry workshop, which we have every Tuesday night and you're invited to come to, um, a lot of poems are about that anxiety that people can, and th that anxiety comes out in a lot of different ways. And I was surprised by the different ways it came out in me. Uh, you know, very slant wise, I don't feel capable of talking intelligently or meaningfully in poetry about the direct experience of other people. But it's really surprising the kinds of feelings and memories that come out when you dig down into those initial feelings of concern and anxiety. So I have two poems. Uh, one's called The Widower, and one is called Gravity in Jerusalem, and I'll end with those. Um, yeah, The Widower. My grandfather worked as a barber of sorts in a death camp in a room the size of a two-car garage, shearing the hair of transported women. Transported women. They hesitated to sit down in the kitchen chair beside which he stood with an electric razor whose black cord hung down from a rafter. A black cord hanging from rafter to razor. No talking was permitted and really none was necessary. The long ratchet of transport having cinched the unbelievable truth ending in canvas sacks for hair. Canvas sacks of hair. He married each of them with his eyes. What else could he promise but eternal love when one hand cup the nape of their neck, while the other raised the razor to her temple. And um, I'm sorry, I should have given you a trigger warning, and I didn't. Um, the last poem I'm going to read, um, not heavy in the same way at all. It's called Gravity in Jerusalem. I wanted to grow up to be a rain cloud over an upstate reservoir during a drought. Then it was my ambition to become a slender woman or a book jacket cut from a grocery bag or a trumpet or a garden rake or a handkerchief embroidered with a strawberry heart. The evenings were much longer then. I wanted to be a satchel with latches that slid sideways to open. A cutting board bearing the wounds of nutrition on my back. The scratchy absolution of a dollar bill passing through the coin slot of a charity tin at the cashier of a candy store. Like the colors in comic books, when comic books were printed on fool's cap, my irises would dilate for the dishwasher light in the darkened kitchen and contract at the open refrigerator door. The brass drain in the kitchen sink scrubbed with persistence to a low brass glimmer was my art school. It whispered, we are brass kin. 
and you are me in human form. I wanted to grow up to be the lavender soap in a lingerie drawer or the handgun under the cable knit tennis sweater on the top shelf of the front hall closet. I envied the moldings around doorways and wanted more than friends to crawl inside a mezuzah to study its scrolls in seclusion and to emerge from my cell like morning in Manhattan with muted light on the brick facade of an apartment building. I wanted to marry. I wanted to marry a book of matches once, to have children like misaligned wallpaper seams and teach them how to blow their noses and spit up phlegm and how to fit a square god in a round soul and how to see all fathers as bags of donated clothing waiting by the door. There is more light in a glass doorknob than gravity in Jerusalem. Thank you all for putting up with me. I look forward to hearing from Sean. Thanks again to JCC and to Baruch November. And nice to meet you, Phil. You know, I just read that poem and uh, it was on middle, right? Huh? The last, the last poem, I just read it uh, on... And Rattle. Yeah, it was a poet. I just read it. It was nice to hear it. Thank you. And, and, you, are, and you are handsome, by the way. <laughs> it's not you. I need to hear that from Phil. I know. I, yeah, you know <laughs> Thank you I very can. much, though. Every little bit helps. <laughs> Wonderful from both Allison and Arthur. Wow. Boy, thank you so much. But we have one left here. <laughs> um, and I'm just delighted to... Uh, to, to uh, introduce and hear him read. Uh, Sean Singer is the author of, I'm looking at my thing because I'm in a dark place here, is in the author of Discography, Yale University Press, won the uh, Yale Series of Younger Pre Poets Award. You may have heard of that award. Selected by uh, some obscure poet by the name of W.S. Merwin. <laughs> wow. And the norm. Barber First Book Award from the Poetry Society of America. Uh, okay, wow. Honey and Smoke, his book from Eyewear Publishing, and Today in the Taxi, Tupelo Press, won the 2022 National Jewish Book Award. So, um, I'm just going to go home now. <laughs> He's, he runs a manuscript consultation service at his, uh, find it on his website. But I'm not done. <laughs> I admire the way Sean's taxi is a microcosm, not just of America, but in the cab, we find not unusual New York suspects, but also the figures out of Sean's prodigious imagination. And you know what I'm talking about if you've read his poems, and I hope you do, if you haven't already. Kafka, some of the of his prodigious imagination, go, I own a writer, a ferret, the Kabbalists, and I can go on forever. You name it. Singer's unimagination of how it took a custom a can of wine in the abs door pocket and pop practicing box cello service, uh, suites for 12 years before performing them in public. So I don't know if you got that, but he yokes them together. Uh, amazingly enough. Blake saw uh, the world on a grain of sand. Sean sings, nay, in his contemporary multi-complicated space, a universe in a New York taxi. And on that taxi radio is probably going to be jazz. As required or expected, nor necessarily easy, given all the circumstances that make up our complicated lives. But I have to admit, I have an amount and man, admiration for writers and artists that are the art beyond their own work. Sean is an extraordinary example. For a long time on Facebook, which is how I got to know him in my own way, Sean would provide a real service by posting a poem every day, the range of which was extraordinary and well worth reading. And he also posts them on his blog, which uh, The Sharpener, which again, you can find on his website, and I totally recommend it. 
The quality of these poems can be summed up by one by another one of our poets this evening who said, Allison, <laughs> and I'm quoting you, I get a lot of poetry emails every day, but this one, meaning Sean's emails, I read. We're fortunate that Sean Singer is the next poet we want to hear. Please welcome Sean Singer. Thanks so much um, for coming. So these are all uh, prose poems um based on my experiences driving this taxi which i did from 2014 until march of 20 when covid started and um <clears throat> there's sort of three main characters or voices one is franz kafka one is the bass player charles mingus and one is um the lord who has a female voice one tenth Today in the taxi, I brought a man from Midtown to someplace in Astoria near the airport. He asked me to take him round trip. We got to the address and he waited outside the place and someone came out and handed him a brown paper bag. The man gave the person some cash. Then we left. He asked me to drive him to the E train instead. I don't believe in saints or omens, early winds, or the pink luck of a sunset. I don't see the Lord's love with her incisions and furry ornaments. The vehicle is not just a way to get to the crime, but somehow to bless whatever the journey needs. I use my braking and steering inputs to turn inward, or even to go down the uncertain road. Anti-venom. Today in the text, I got a fare from Parkchester to the Bronx Zoo. She finally came out of the building, put her baby in the car seat and said, I forgot something upstairs. Then she left the baby in the car and went back inside for seven or eight minutes. I couldn't believe it. I'm a safe person to leave a baby with, but she didn't know that. I was nervous. Some people live without contradiction. I remained calm, though the situation was beyond the job description. Don Bias had a serpent's tooth affixed to the octave key of his tenor saxophone. Perhaps it helped him push into the wilderness or to ward off evil. One sunny July, Kafka says he wept over the report of the trial of Marie Abraham, who because of poverty and hunger, strangled her nine month old with a man's tie she used as a garter. Burnt plastic. Today in the taxi, I picked up a Wall Street type on Park Avenue near 48th Street. He was going to Montclair, New Jersey. His house was on fire and he spent the trip on the phone talk, barking orders at his wife, his roofer, his contractor, his insurance company, and at me. He kept saying, go this way. Which way are you going? He said, there are firearms and ammunition in the house. Periodically, he held back tears. It was a long 25 miles for me and I suppose longer for him. We got there, the house was burning. The Talmud says, nature rules over all things except the terror it inspires. Azabache, black. Today in the text, I brought two English women from Battery Park to Columbus Circle who told me they have a business making art from people's dreams. They said how they crystallized the dream into their projects. I thought of Bruno Schultz, who said, when people sleep, distant worlds pass across their closed eyelids. When Charles Mingus was dying of ALS, he went to Cuernavaca. Pachita, a curandero, gave him bitter teas and enchanted creams. When Mingus dreamed, he leapt and swam across rivers like salmon chased by bears. When he hatched from a mass of pink eggs, he was a fish and swam over the bodies of his dead ancestors. Drive. Today in the text, I drove the movie star Carrie Mulligan from the Upper West Side to Park Slope. I recognized her blonde face and perfect porcelain hand from the movie Drive. One of the many similarities between me and Ryan Gosling is that we both drive Carrie Mulligan around the city. My whole body was running down the stresses. I hate gratuitous celebrity sightings. The sun was a peach more pushed aside than struck down. 
I felt completely like a driver or maybe a writer. Kafka wrote to Felice Bauer and said he drew up a list of things he sacrificed for writing. Just as I am thin, he said, and I'm the thinnest person I know, there's nothing to me which in relation to writing, one could call superfluous in the sense of overflowing. Days of winter. Today in the text, I brought a Chinese couple, parents of a student at Columbia from Amsterdam Avenue to JFK. The girl was crying, the mother was crying. The parents sat in silence for most of the trip. They didn't speak English and I didn't speak Chinese. I did offer them a little package of tissues. On the other hand, the sun came out and it warmed to 24 degrees. A driver should find a fixed object on the road, a sign or a tree, and when the car passes in front of it, count three seconds before his own car passes it, then add a second for every hazard, rain or darkness. The road's not unlike a little press between vessel that the car pushes along its black bloodstream. A psalm instructs that it will be as it is said. Limbo. Today in the taxi driving a commercial real estate type from 43rd and Madison to 57th and Park, I said, would you prefer to go at Madison or Park? He said, it doesn't matter. Either way, we're fucked. And it was true when a black pair of birds burst from the building like fulfillment. I too seek to weave a memory from foam, a black bottle opener and the blackest bottle in the flow of liquids. You cannot know it. You can see it. General Beadle Smith reported in April 1945, when they liberated Buchenwald, he witnessed General Eisenhower go to the opposite side of the road and vomit. From a distance, I saw Patton bend over, holding his head with one hand and his abdomen with the other. I too became sick. When the oncoming headlights are too bright, it is said you should look at, to the side at the lines on the road. You would stop yourself from being blinded and stop yourself to imagine the road ahead unstrung and the rubber against it. Schism. Today in the taxi, a passenger got in and she was crying. I don't know why. We left Astoria for Williamsburg. I gave her a package of tissues and she went on her way. Kafka said, crying is alarming for me. I cannot cry. When other people cry, it seems like a strange, incomprehensible natural phenomenon. I thought maybe she was going through a breakup or perhaps it was a passage in a novel. Some people think of Williamsburg as the hipster apocalypse and others, the Orthodox, know the Lord is there with them. She's pushing a shopping cart full of plastic bottles rescued from trash cans. Crying literally means to ask for loudly. She mumbles to a drop of salt water but she's really saying, you are worthy of asking and having your question heard. Stretching out to the Milky Way. Today in the taxi, I had my three maps, my Bialian apple and a thermos of water. I parked under a bridge and looked at its terminal rivets. The air was like an archive of ammonia and tree resin. At times, the city is glossy with simultaneous alerts. E minor Sonata. Today in the taxi driving north on 31st Street in Astoria, a bus went through a red light and nearly killed me and my passenger. Hit with a heavy object, some carry-on with wet fur is misshapen red, part raccoon, washed in road light. If ever there was want and you have found it, if something was lost, let it be discovered. Dusk varnish, please swallow the continent whole. Earlier, my passengers were making out like they were the last people on earth. Simone Weil said, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. City. Tonight in the taxi, I checked the console. I made sure I had plenty of hand sanitizer, tissues, some candy. The traffic invades like a black swarm of spiders turnings. 
Everything witnesses everything else. There's a hundredfold harvest of faces, each in a window, and each window in a death machine. Floating. Today in the taxi, I brought the famous jazz drummer's wife, Elena, all around Harlem doing errands. Cobb is the last surviving member of the band that recorded Kind of Blue. We went to the bank and to the pharmacy. She let loose with some stories. It was as if this music was not alone waking up from its dream. I remembered a psychiatrist who said, children wake up in the middle of the night, not to see if you're there, but if they're there. I thought of how his wire brushes made this sound like neither fish nor mammal, this warm ebbing handling a spine. Entire city. Tonight in the taxi, the yellow moon was a coin and the kale florets moved serrated edges along an orange grid, a citadel on a hill spiral. No one breathed a note and a ruin rubbed a fish backbone over a texture. Before you put it in reverse, touch second. Yesterday in the taxi, I was everywhere. From 127th and St. Nicholas Avenue to 118th and Amsterdam Avenue, then from 106th and Columbus to Canal and Varick, then from Canal and Wooster to Greenwich and Beach, then from Worth and Park Row to South 8th Street in Williamsburg, then from Williamsburg to El LaGuardia, then from the Harlan Metro North Station to 118th and Amsterdam again, then Broadway and 107th Street to 40th and Park, then from Grand Central to Grand Street near Christie Street, then Delancey Street to Kingsland Avenue, Williamsburg, then Williamsburg to Sunnyside and Queens, then from Sunnyside to Sunnyside, then from 68th in York to 69th in Lex, then from 60th in Madison to 75th in Columbus, then from the Natural History Museum to 37th and 8th, then from 35th and 8th to 72nd and 1st, and from 72nd in New York to 86th in Central Park West. I moved the city around the city. I crisscrossed the intersections. I sliced open the cellophane wrapping on a cigarette box. It's vital to the driver to be alert and calm at the same time. I watched through the window and accelerated up the on-ramps. I put on the hazards. I lifted suitcases. I couldn't even identify some of the languages they spoke. Pink gloves. Tonight in the taxi, I drove four women from a bachelorette party complete with their tiaras and feathers to another bar. Already happy, they pushed the bride to be forward and she asked me how I thought she looked. I was too taken aback to answer anything. She was liquid, prehistoric, and my little body burned. I thought of the Lord throwing handfuls of sequins at the party as if to say, there is no other life but this one. Voyagers. Tonight, uh, today in the taxi, I was thankful for all the near misses and sudden stops, times I nearly died or almost nearly. I wondered about the raccoon I saw in Central Park North rooting through a garbage can. Could this have been the Lord wading through the black molasses of night? And how many years will her wandering go on? Glands and nerves. Today in the text, they brought two women from 19th Street and 6th Avenue to 48th Street and Broadway. Unfortunately, they worked with Fox News, talked about Fox and Friends, and were excited to see the new Chick-fil-A and took pictures of it. They were polite, visiting from Nashville and awful. Charlotte Solomon, before she was gassed in 1943, wrote that culture and education are laughable entities that we have constructed only to see them helplessly destroyed a ferocious power. I thought of a trench at the bottom of the ocean, filling with darkness and impurity, what Kabbalists call off-sourcings. Shells crack open like vessels and lose sparks of light. Driving taught me to accept people for who they are, but other times I wish an asteroid crashing into the city from the cold drain of space. Let's see. 
which seed? Today in the taxi, my passenger was crying into her phone. She just had a miscarriage. Who was she talking to? Her mother, perhaps. She hoped there was an invisible hand that had some purpose in her tragedy. I pictured the Lord in her shelf of jars and vapors. Her amino acids and carbons fit together with one black wheel and one white wheel. Every Sabbath, the rabbi would remove the slip of paper with her name on it from the golem's mouth, and it would become lifeless, nothing but a thimble full of little clay cells. Take hold of it. Tomorrow in the taxi will be another day. I'll read the book twice and lend it out for someone else to read quickly. Then I'll read it again. When a prophet asked the Lord about what the book meant, she said, turn it and turn it again for everything is in it. I pictured the black fire of her ink and the white fire of her parchment, everything far reaching. Among the blur of noise and chaos of the demonic coming from the city's every window, she commented, be silent. For this is the way I have determined it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sean. Wow, really, really appreciate it. Wonderful. Boy, so we have a, a motel, we have car wash, we have taxi. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling all over the world. Um, so did anybody have a... Any, anything you want to say? Any questions? Any comments? Any opening it up to the to you guys and any sense of? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Be shy. This, is your, this is your chance. Unmike yourself. D mic or anti mic, whatever the word is. <laughs> um. Tell the poets how much you love them. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> speak, speak. <laughs> I'm blown away. That was a great reading. Thank I you. Mean, uh, the whole night. Yeah, great. Isn't that great? Whoa. Really, really great. Thank you. Nice. I'm, yeah. I'm so glad that I attended. It's my first one, and I'm looking forward to others. Very nice. Amazing poets. Yeah, I'll keep you in the lo loop, Yvette. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. This is very wonderful. Thank you very much for hosting this and for inviting us to this. You're, you're welcome. Glad you made it. Uh, I think that Erica is going to send links to their collections if you're interested in oh, nice. more. Yeah. Sure. Um, and uh, it's just... Um, well, I said I know just personally that I've read <laughs> um, and haven't heard read, haven't heard them read. It's another level. It's just so wonderful to even um, on Zoom. <laughs> and um, I think Zoom has an advantage that people can come in from all different places, but um, it, it works. It's what we have. And, and I really appreciate poets being so generous. And we actually have a couple of poets that are uh, on the screen that are coming up to read. Uh, I know that David Swerdlow is on there and he's going to read next time. And Ricky's up there. And he, I'm not, I can't remember when you're reading Ricky, but it'll be sometime soon. And well, so that's cool. It, it was a beautiful reading. And um, I am was moved so much by all of these different voices and uh, their unique perspectives on their world and the unique music that they brought to it, I found myself uh, attached to their voices and to the screen into which they were speaking. It was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, what a thrill for me. I have books from all three of these folks and I've read them and relished them, but to hear them in your voices to hear those words delivered in your vibrant voices. What a gift tonight. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that's why it's so fun to do this. You know? Bill and I get really lucky. We always seem to pick the right poets. Yeah. I don't know how. Maybe they pick us. Some Cosmically, they pick us in a way to, to be featured. But I always feel like 
we've never had a bad poet um, perform. <laughs> uh, so, so we're really lucky, and we're really lucky that the JCC keeps on uh, creating a platform for us. And uh, I want all of you to uh, seriously think about coming to every reading this season. We have a wonderful uh, menu of poets for you that will leave you wanting more. Next next time we have David Swordlow, who you just heard from, and, and the incredible poet, who's an incredible poet himself, but also Jackie Bashiro. Some of you may know what an amazing poet she is. Who's the third poet? I'm, I'm forgetting. Uh, I'll tell you Sam Taylor? Sam Taylor, maybe? No, Avia Kushner, Jackie. Oh, yeah. And yeah, Jackie, Jackie Nostro, and yeah. Avia Kushner. She's amazing. And, we can't forget her. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, they're all just, you know, <laughs> all these poets are just so great that, you know, we're just so very fortunate. So I think we've, we've done a, a pretty full plate here. You know, this is kind of like a, a banquet feast yeah. so uh i think maybe this is this is good but, but what do you think you think we could yeah i think i think we, yeah i think it's it's just time to say goodbye unfortunately time to or, say, let's eat it's time to say let's eat is what it is what let's it eat manja let's get that pastrami sandwich at um crab and belly all right yes. okay phil Thanks i think so corky's and lenny's yeah. closed is that true yeah, What's I already did. Corky's and Lenny's closed. closed. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. So sad. Tragic. So sad. Yeah. Uh, just Your poem has incredible. just commemorating it now. It's important. Yeah, yeah, it's an elegy. <laughs> but it'll always we'll be We'll have to do a deli reading someday someday. <laughs> we should do a deli reading. I love that. Maybe even we'll do a whole anthology probably of Jewish deli poems. There's got to be. Anyway. Anybody else have deli poems? Thanks so much. Oh, the delis are going extinct. Delis are no. going extinct. That's the thing. We're going to have to do it very soon. Yeah, we ought to do some specialized poems. You know, like a gefilte fish reading. <laughs> a, uh, you know, a herring reading. Uh, you know, a niche reading. Why don't we have a reading where we're eating while we're reading? <laughs> uh, when I'm up, I promise I'll read my deli poem. All right. All right. Okay, now is that a Corky Lenny's deli or is that a no, um, no, no, Youngstown, Ohio, Elm Street? It's not oh, crap. Oh. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I'm going to be on my the edge of my seat on that. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, poets. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining and us. Thank you, Thanks Erica. Of course. Erica, thank you, Erica. Thank you, thank you so Erica, much. Erica, this was your first one. What do you, what do you think? I know. Are... I, I was about to say, it's my first one, and it was absolutely amazing. You, uh, I mean, Erica, all... you're going to, I mean, she, like, works all day and like at the JCC and then stays there for this. And Of course. Yeah. Thank you. It was, it was very interesting, you know, as my first one, obviously. Um, but you guys had just such different uh, perspectives on just everything. And, and you've had different experiences as well. So it was very interesting to listen um, in your own words, just kind of how you interpret the world. Um, it was very cool, very interesting. And I look forward to our next ones. And I look forward to uh, hopefully see uh, the authors to come back for the next round, you know, just to say hi. <laughs> but yeah. awesome. Yeah, I will definitely send um, the links to uh, all three authors' books, both Sean's, Arthur's, and Allison's book. So I'll send like the link in the email. And I'll also send um, the other two events that you can sign up for that we have set in our um, in our website right now. So you can sign up for the one in February and the one in March right now. So I'll send those in the email as well. And we're also having, of course, our series goes until May, but April mm -hmm. and May are in the next JCP uh, season. Yeah. Season, right. yeah, they they haven't launched that way yet. That'll be our okay. spring session. We're in our winter yeah. session, so but yes, yeah. yep. We have great poets all the way through May, so mm -hmm. that's the great way to get through the winter. 